why don't we uh, talk right now with David Blau. He is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at University of Michigan. He's a Wolverine, and he has created the world's smallest computer, the Michigan Micromote. Professor Blau, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Is that the design behind you on the blackboard for the Micromoat? Well, not exactly. It's uh, it's uh, further work that we're doing and uh, things related to it. Yes, that's cool. It's, uh, that's neat. It's changing every day. Uh, what's on the blackboard? So, <laughs> how how big is the Micromoat? Um, it's small enough that it can sit on the uh, edge of a, a nickel. Uh, it's about a millimeter or so in width, uh, about two millimeters long, and about a millimeter tall. Wow. Wow. Now, is that just the processor? You call it a computer. Does it have I.O. and everything? That's right. Uh, so it is a, uh, a full computer. Um, and so it has an input device. And this being a sensor, the input device is uh, uh, sensing so something, uh, pressure or temperature or an imaging. Um, it is also, uh, it has a processor, a little CPU, and it has memory. Uh, and then it has... Uh, an output device, which in this, this case is a, is a radio. Um, and so it can both uh, take data in, it can process it, it's uh, intelligent, and it can output it. And then it's also complete in the sense that it's self-contained. You don't need uh, some accessory with it. It has its own battery built in, into that uh, millimeter stack. Um, and it has power management and everything else that it needs to, to operate. This is incredible. So it's fully functional. I mean how would this compare? I, I'm a big fan of the uh, ESP8266, uh, which, for uh -huh. those of you who don't know, is like a small, it started out as a Wi-Fi chip that you could add onto a, an Arduino or something like that. But it's really small. It's about the size of a postage stamp. And now people right. have been able to figure out a way to program it using the Arduino IDE and all that. It's great. And it, mm. and it's, it gives you a you know, Wi-Fi signal and a little yeah. computer and memory and everything. So how does this compare to something like that? So the, the really the big difference is that it's it's not actually that difficult to make uh, the CPU and the chips small. What is really difficult is to make the complete system small, mm. because what happens is that, uh, for instance, if you in the chip you described, uh, that is shrunk down to a small size, but it consumes a lot of power, uh, and that means you need to plug it in to the wall uh, or into uh, attach it to a large battery. So it's not that hard to make a small little chip that is hooked up to a very large battery. Uh, to make the complete system really small, you need to shrink the battery down, which means that you need to shrink down the power consumption to very, very small numbers. Uh, in our case, nanowatts. Um, and in addition to that, you need to somehow also place the uh, antenna and the radio and the sensing input uh, devices in there. Uh, so that's really uh, the challenge, is to make the entire thing uh, shrink to the size that, uh, that we're looking at. You do this just because you can, or is there a purpose for this? <laughs> well, in, initially, uh, we did it partly because we could, and we were doing a lot of low-power technology, and then we are like, wow, we could really shrink the entire system down to really small sizes. But what we found is that, uh, you know, when you shrink a, a computer down to such sizes, and the computer is smart, it can do things, it allows you to uh, do smart things in places that you couldn't do before. Um, so there's a lot of applications, for instance, in the medical area, um, and in the medical area, what's really uh, helpful is that when the device becomes very small, uh, it becomes implantable, for instance, uh, with a syringe. Uh, so the implantation can be much, much easier. And that's very important, actually, to doctors. And also, uh, the device is rigid, like all medical devices. Uh, and the smaller it is, the less it, it sort of the body reacts to it. Uh, and that's also, uh, that is also critical. Uh, and then there's other application spaces in surveillance, in environmental monitoring. Uh, right now, uh, we are going to go to Tahiti to study snails um, uh, with a biology professor. Uh, these snails are very small, and you can't pick a, stick a large computer on it, so we're sticking these tiny little uh, micromotes on them. Did, did you pick the snails first, or did you pick Tahiti first <laughs> as a destination? Yeah, 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 yeah. What I, can I'm we not study going in Tahiti? Myself, actually. <laughs> we had several volunteers uh, to go and uh, supervise the project. Of course, of course. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the power of this computer. How many, how many MIPS, how many teraflops can it do? Is it, is it PC uh. power, or is it much less? Um, it is, uh, it is, runs quite slowly. Uh, the processor runs around a maximum of around a megahertz. So uh, an M flop, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
If, but that's a term that you probably haven't heard for a while. But when we're doing um, monitoring of signals uh, and, and environmental conditions, uh, typically that is fast enough. We do also have now accelerators that allow us to do uh, smart uh, processing like neural networks uh, and things like that, which are accelerated to do more powerful computation and do things like image recognition and things like that on the on the system as well. Could you cluster these? Yeah, the uh, you mean the system? Yeah, I mean, um, could you have multiple micro oh, modes? I see. Yes. Um, in fact, uh, right now uh, the system talks to a base station um, and. Uh, and is this how it's talking? By the way, the video we're showing is of light flashing. That's its I.O.? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's one of the forms of I.O. We have a radio, RF radio, oh, okay. and we have a couple different versions. One that can only go a couple centimeters, which is what you use if you implant it, but also one that can go about 20 meters, oh, okay. uh, which uh, allows you to really use it, for instance, in a house. Um, but uh, to initially program it and synchronize it, uh, we use light uh, because any system, you need to sort of have a reset button. And on a computer, it's a little button that you push. Yeah. Um, but we can't have that on something that's a millimeter size. Uh, you know, there's no space, there's no wires coming out of it. It's entirely encapsulated in epoxy. It's just a little block. And, uh, and so we found that light is the easiest way to have a receiver that is always on, it's always listening. Uh, and that receiver consumes about 100 picowatts of oh, power. Oh, wow. That's great. Um, yes. Uh, so that's uh, uh, one th uh, thousandth of a millionth of an amp uh, or of a watt. Uh, so it's a really small power consumption, but we need to leave it always on because we never know when we might need to reset it or uh, do something like uh, reprogram it or something like that. Where is the power coming from? Do you? <laughs> I don't see a plug. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So it's all encapsulated inside. Uh, okay. We have a little battery. The battery is actually a millimeter by two millimeters and... Um, you know, if you compare, for instance, to the, uh, uh, the cell phone batteries you mentioned earlier, those are in the thousands of uh, milliamp hour, uh, so about an amp hour. Uh, these are microamp hours. Um, so, uh, again, a million times less um, and uh, power uh, that we get out of the battery. And that can last us on the order of maybe, depending on the system, maybe a couple weeks uh, or so. Uh, but then to extend the lifetime, uh, we have also harvesting capability. Uh, the, the most common one that we use is using light. Uh, so the system can sustain itself with a tiny little photo cell, uh, PV cell, solar cell that is on top of the stack uh, that will harvest the ambient light in a room, for instance. And we can survive uh, perpetually uh, in room light. Uh, wow. Recharging give, the battery. That is amazing. That is crazy. To give you an idea of the power of this, a Commodore 64 was a little under a megahertz. Mm -hmm. So you're roughly the power of a C64 in this grain yeah. of rice. It's got its yeah. own battery. It's getting power yeah. from the environment. Yeah. What an amazing uh, thing. I could see people swallowing this, right? Well, it, it, that, yeah, exactly. But I guess the, the, I mean, if you did what it sounds like you're intending for it to do, which is to be used in, in medical uh, testing and things like that, and you implant it, then you don't, you know, you're not getting any light. So in that case, would you attach a separate battery, a small separate battery or something? Or how, how are you going to power it if it's inside that's, my body? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, and actually, it turns out your body is transparent to infrared light. Ah, okay. Um, so we actually are able to both communicate to it uh, for resetting and programming, as well as charge it with infrared light in the body. Um, people also use a lot of uh, RF harvesting uh, in the body, and we could use that as well. Um, uh, but light is, uh, is quite effective, actually. So. Um, and your body, we don't, can't see it, uh, because we can't see in the IR range, but your body is actually uh, translucent or transparent in that uh, wavelength. Wow. So you said there's a there's a version with a camera on it as well. That's right. That's right. We have one version with a camera. It has a <laughs> motion you, detection. How I don't un, how could you fit a camera on that thing? <laughs> well, it turns out there's actually very small lenses that are used, for instance, in uh, very uh, fine uh, surgery. Um, I think uh, we have an and, image of a coffee cup uh, from the camera. Do you have that, Brian? So this That's is, right. This is from the camera on the micromote, the rice-sized. That ain't bad. No, not at all. 
that? Yeah, it's not a, a you know it's not HD or anything like that. Uh, we're working on higher resolution. But uh, the first image that was made was uh, the girlfriend of the student that was working on the project, and we could definitely recognize her and um, see who she was. So. And that's just a raw image without any kind of touch up or uh, or other correction that we've made. Wow. Um, so, um, yeah. So we can take images, but of course it's limited. Uh, we can't store. We can store about sixty images on the on the system, um, and then we can read them out with the radio uh, later. So you did mention surveillance as one potential use of this. Absolutely. I mean, imagine. Uh, That's right. Holy cow. Yeah. I imagine the government's going to be interested in this. Yeah. Uh, as well Are as you able to make these in quantity yet, or is this a onesie, twosie kind of a thing? No, we're, we're making them in uh, uh, tens to hundreds. What? Um, so each, you know, we're still refining the overall process. There's a lot of also assembly uh, questions that we have to answer, like how do we uh, encapsulate the system and, and things like that. Uh, but we're right now running runs every uh, uh, couple of weeks of uh, around 20 or 40 or so of these units. Uh, how, how, how typical is the process? I mean, does it have registers? Uh, oh, yeah. It's got an yeah, ALU. It's, it's, got, it's got a stack, all of that stuff. It's like a traditional processor? Yeah, yeah. It's actually an ARM M0. Oh, my uh, gosh. So it's wow. industry standard oh ARM processor. <laughs> and how much, uh, how much RAM and how much storage? You said 60 pictures. That's a decent amount of storage, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the processor runs off a small little bit of uh, SRAM, uh, which is uh, eight kilobytes, not very much, not enough to store a picture. Uh, uh, a picture. But then we also have a flash unit uh, where we can store, and we have uh, two uh, megabit of storage there, which is enough for, uh, for, the, for the images that we need to store. Uh, and we can, of course, do compression and things like that as well. So I don't want to be greedy, but can you get even smaller? Ah. Uh, um, Yes, uh, we, we probably can. The, the system is made modular so that we can swap things in and out. Uh, you know, we can put an imager on it, we can put pressure sensor on it, things like that. Uh, but we could shrink it smaller. Um, we had a, a project to try to shrink it all the way down so that it's like uh, maybe a few hundred microns in size. Uh, it gets more challenging uh, and we're not there yet. Uh, but I believe that will happen. Um, and the functionality will be a little bit more limited. Um, yeah. uh, but I think that's the direction overall that, uh, that things are going. And it will open up new, new applications that we can't actually really even maybe uh, you know, anticipate at this point. Smart dust. Yeah, this is incredible. Yeah. Are you going to uh, productize this at all for, for hobbyists or anybody? Are you going to, is there going to be a Kickstarter? Are you going to send some to the makerspace? What's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> we, we are exploring, uh, we're in early stages of exploring uh, commercial uh, commercialization. Um, it, it, they must be expensive to make right now. Right now they're expensive to make because they're still made in very limited uh, yeah. runs, uh, yeah. just tens or so. Uh, but in principle, if they go to high volume, they could be made cheap. Um, and so there could be, um, as, as we ramp up down the road, you could uh, strew them around, uh, have lots of them uh, sitting in various places. Um, you know, if you lost a few, it wouldn't be a big deal. Wow. The good thing is graduate students are cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Do, are they, sit, like are they sitting at microscopes with little tweezers to assemble these? or? Uh, we, we actually uh, make the chips ourselves we, uh, in the sense that we design them. Um, the chip designs are ours, and we have it actually manufactured at uh, standard wow. chip manufacturing facilities. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do the assembly actually also with third parties. Uh, we've learned that uh, graduate students are not very good at, uh, at sort of doing the assembly. Uh, we need a sustainable process. Um, yeah. You know, uh, students have lost several of them. Uh, <laughs> various places, so and that's fine. Uh, what? You know. Lose a grain of rice? How could that happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you drop it, it can be very hard yeah. to find. <laughs> yeah, I dropped it on the floor. It's like we're, holy cow. You know, this is really fascinating, David. I, I'm so glad you could join us and, 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 and give Thank us you. a look yeah. at it. What yeah, my amazing... mind is blown. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. Mind-blowing. The Michigan Micro Moat. Professor David Blau is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at the University of Michigan. Uh, Dr. Blau, thank you so much for joining us uh, and uh, sharing this uh, amazing advance. My pleasure. Us. Yeah, really yeah. great. Really Thanks. neat thank stuff. You. Makes you want to go to U Mission. Oh, that's what I was Study just computer thinking. science, my, right? My son is considering uh, computer science for his major in college. I'm thinking, hmm, maybe University of Michigan yeah. would be a good place to go. We'll no see. No kidding. Yeah. No kidding.